Hello, I'm joined by the talent behind, one of the many talents behind Warrior Nine, Mr. Simon Barry. Thank you so much for taking your time to speak with me today. It's a pleasure. No problem. I'm happy to be here. First, I would really, really like to say, of course, how refreshing and appreciative it is for how inclusive Warrior Nun is. Um, it's easy to see how much you, uh, the talented set of writers, and and really everyone who is uh, a part of Warrior Nun, uh, really revere the story building uh, and construction blocks uh, of the series and the characters as much as you do the fandom and the importance of seeing all that reflected on screen. So I wanted to say thank you, of course. Uh, and oh, I appreciate that and I'll pass it on to the, the writers, directors and the crew for sure. And the cast. <laughs> Everybody who who has a hand in this series, I really feel from, from all aspects of, of each building block has really uh, put a lot of passion, uh, again, a lot of reverence into this series and um, it really starts at the very beginning, uh, the building blocks, as I keep calling them, of, of things with the construction of it all. Um, and and I wanted to to just say that it's just uh, it just feels like every single hand is a loving hand and a and a, and, a, and a clever hand at that set as well. At a, at a very very um, and a very uh, at a hand that just has a lot of of uh, of love and passion behind it well my job is to assemble people around me who are better at everything they do than i am <laughs> and so i can kind of be a, the best thing i can be is like a a, a conductor and inspiration and help solve problems because the amount of work that goes into making tv shows it's enormous there's over 200 people working on on Warrior Nun, um, probably even three, almost 300. So if I can make their lives better and make their job um, what they want it to be, to be proud of the work they do and to be part of a show that they can be, they can stand up for, then I'm, you know, I'm very happy to keep those people, um, you know, engaged, uh, just like the uh, just like the fans want to be engaged. And as a viewer myself, I love TV and film that engages me and makes and allows me to participate and think and and uh, connect. And so, if I can do that, then you know that's kind of the the bottom line for me. That's the the mi the bare minimum. The the caliber of craftsmanship, uh, as I keep just saying, is really um, a, a testament to the people that you trust in as well, too. You need to have to trust in the people behind the blocks that you build and the construction that you create. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, my theory is I hire the best people and I get out of their way. <laughs> 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 I was gonna say, what is your process? But that's it. <laughs> that's perfect. That's kind of it. I mean, I I, I feel like with Warrior Nun, especially, we really got a, an incredible uh, talent, uh, um, a group of talented people who are exceptional at all of their um, uh, all of their specialties and all of their crafts. I mean, they're all art artists. You know, they're not just doing a job. They really love what they do, and they really put their heart and soul into it. So uh, that's sort of like, if I can start the process with those people, everything gets better and everything uh, improves. And so it really is sort of talent, picking talent and having an eye for, for uh, people who are as, um, I guess, just committed uh, to making, to filmmaking on every level, uh, whether it's on the page as a writer, um, or on the set or in post-production, I can honestly say that everyone I engage with is a storyteller and an artist. And that's kind of the, if I can just sort of make that the, the entry point, then we're off, you know, we're off to the races because we'll have people who really are um, thinking in terms of story and commitment and, and um, it just elevates everything they do and it elevates the show. Um, this year, everything has felt amplified in season two. 
uh, when I say this year, it's been two years later, <laughs> more uh -huh. later, obviously. A long two years. <laughs> um, but everything feels very amplified and elevated. Uh, the pacing, the cinematography, um, the all the VFX, um, and and it feels also um, very visually and symbolically um, that that's a lot of the storytelling as much as it is like a paper for the you know portrayals to jump off of yeah why is that also an important part of um, the storytelling process for this particular series of warrior, warrior nun and how does that really kind of continue that elevation that we get within this special series well we i guess i mean half of it is planning and half of it is accidental and half of, i guess is the the way to say it i mean we do make an effort to layer I guess imagery and symbols into the show. It's easy with regards to the themes and the mythology that we're dealing with, because we have obviously the the Catholic Church and we have um, the symbols of the um, of the OCS that we've kind of borrowed from, you know, Christianity. So it's that part is you know usually is something we can lean into when we find it. And in places like Spain, there's so many places that have this um, everywhere, you know, symbology is everywhere and history is everywhere. And then the other half of it is a kind of happy accidents where we put five pieces together that may, to, may individually not seem like they were going to work as a symbol. And then when you assemble them, you realize that they do. And you kind of then, you you I guess you could say we improvise sometimes in terms of finding those opportunities to layer in symbolism. And uh, an example of that would be, you know, at the end of episode eight, where Ava is in Beatrice's arms uh, on the ground and having that opportunity to have a shot of them with the cross behind them, which is evocative of so much um, art and uh, famous, you know, famous paintings that, you know, you, that's where I would say we, we take advantage of it because it's there and we sort of lean into it and say, well, this is some symbolism that a lot of people are familiar with. And, you know, we can, we can nod our head or wink towards it. And that's, but we don't want to make it heavy handed. We never want it to feel like it's important or overdone. It's really more just a nice, I guess you could say uh, it's a nice bonus but it never really replaces storytelling or character building. It's more just a kind of an atmospheric extension. I love that it feels like an organic, kind of like a breadcrumb in a way, like, you know, fans um, kind of turned into like Nancy Drew. <laughs> like it's yeah. like elements of like, okay, there's Nancy Drew. I felt a little bit of times there's obviously like Buffy for me, but then we get like a Ocean's 13 this season with the Prada Museum and um, these winks and these nudges or these little things feel like organic breadcrumbs within there. And it's fun to figure out where am I going to match this? Oh, but, or, you know, oh, I found this statue here, you know, and I've seen, I mean, like the fandom is, 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 is a massive detective. In that yeah, I mean, a lot of it is deliberate. I mean, a lot of things we definitely plant in there as a, an homage to everything that came before us, you know, and all the, all the iconography that exists and, and so, and that's fun. I mean, it's fun to do that. And we definitely play on, the tropes that we introduced in season one, we try to do some mirror, you know, mirror work uh, where we're building on lot with, with dialogue, with setting, with scenes um, where we are, you know, sort of building on our own mythology a little bit too. Um, and that's, you know, that's half the fun of being able to do a, an additional season is we are on the one hand, we're innovating, but at the second, on the other hand, we're building on, you know, hopefully the success of the first. So we do try to kind of, I think, I mean, that's how you build, I guess, a, uh, a consistency in a show by having, you know, a, a bit of reference, but also growing and building on that reference into something new. And it works with characters. It works with the mythology and the history of the characters. I mean, it's like the scene with Mother Superior and the flashback um, it's that's that's absolutely inspired 
by the scene in scene in season one where we reveal that she had the halo once upon a time and she lost it and it's when we wrote the scene in episode in season one we we hadn't really conceived of the scene we shot in season two you know um and so it's it's one of those things that as writers we love to do if we can find an opportunity to find something that the audience or we think is good i mean we didn't get a chance to get audience feedback after season one because we wrote season two in the bubble of waiting for season one to come out um so uh there was this we had i had given the writers all of the episodes to watch so we watched them in the writing room together but it was months before uh, the show aired so we were sort of the only fans <laughs> of the show at that point um and we we sort of discussed i think what the audience probably discussed we, we we talked about the things we liked the things we didn't like the things that worked the things that didn't work and we hoped to build on those into season two um now of course we have all that feedback and we're lucky that we kind of stayed in line <laughs> with it because it was too late at a certain point i mean we, we knew the show we had a year between i guess the filming of season two and the release of season one um but the but with the scripts were baked in we were ready to shoot we couldn't really make too big many big changes you know we could do small things though does that mean some things set possibly for season three some blocks well, <laughs> what you're what you're yeah. getting from the fan engagement <laughs> well we make an effort not to take lead to, to be led by the fans because there's no one idea from the fans that is is going to um dig into what we've already discussed so you know we've talked to the writer's room in writing season two had to kind of prepare season three in large in a big in a sort of a broad strokes way because we're planting seeds in season two for things in season three that if we if we're lucky enough to get it and so those things are part of season two in a weird way and those things we don't want to change um and also it's just very very dangerous for us to take suggestions from outside the the group the, the writing room because you never know who is going to say later on hey that was my idea and they they sue you so we actually steer away from reading anything uh suggestion wise and actively dissuade fans from making suggestions i mean on twitter it's fine because it's a public forum but um i think we tend to have bigger fish to fry, if you will, in terms of the ideas that we plug in. And so it's fun to have little details that are more, I guess you could say, anecdotal. But in terms of the big things, the big big, big, big arcs of the show, um, some of those things have already been kind of uh, put into motion. Well, I I love like you're you're talking about building off of some of the things that we get to see in in season one, and uh, I feel like there's um, shadows and, and little lines and boundaries and edges and things um, that we get, and uh, I I really love the growth that feels very natural also um, for within each characters. Everything makes sense to who these core characters we've learned and become familiar with in love of course um so it, it's nice to see like characters such as camilla feel like you're you've grown with her yeah and there's a maturity now behind her as well but there's still the little the little corners and sassiness and cleverness and quickness to her that still keeps her uh at her core of, of like the the younger side of of camilla that yeah, has been like the young, like the little sister, like a little sister. Yeah, exactly. Sister. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, I think it, that's a good, that's a good point. Is we want to preserve the things that are super charming and super attractive about Cam Camilla as a character, but also let her evolve in a way that feels, you know, in line with what's happened and where the show is going. Um, yeah, I mean, we 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 do want the best of both worlds ultimately, if we can have it. 
I had a chance to, to speak to Olivia recently and um, we got to see uh, I, more technology side of, of Camilla this season, but also, again, uh, the younger sister side of her where she was doing a TikTok. <laughs> we got to see Camilla TikTok and she said that someone has somewhere that our TikToks were actually filmed <laughs> from the, during during that moment. So. Uh, I told her if I ever had a chance, uh, I don't know if they exist anywhere, but <laughs> between that and TikToks and a blooper reel, the fans have been asking for, for either yeah. or both. <laughs> I know. I wish I could supply the bloopers. I mean, Netflix, all the footage goes to Netflix and they have it all. So it's really kind of up to them. And I've asked and have been told no. So uh it's maybe at some point they'll they'll be cool with releasing the bloopers um and who knows we'll see what happens i mean maybe i'll i'll go you know rogue and but right now i want to keep them in my good books so of course a month <laughs> as a month tick time ticks <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> Another aspect of the season that I really loved is how the music behind the series really um, has really helped to transport a lot of the scenes and um, really heightened the emotionality and the connection when you're watching as well. So I wanted to ask a little bit about what are some of the musical moments or moments that have music behind them um, that you really felt drove home a lot of the themes or maybe were yeah. some of your favorite that really helped um, really, I guess, epitomize the, the themes within the series that we get to watch. Yeah, I mean, we had an interesting, you know, one of the big changes from season one to season two is we we, we switched composers from Jeff Russo to Tangeline Bolton. And I really liked working with Tangeline in the early stages of the show um, because, the, well, one thing was Tangeline came onto the show as a fan, which was great. And um, she really understood i think the balance of of what we were trying to do tonally which was a little bit of action a little bit of fun and character development but also kind of an uh, building an uh, epic world a, myth a deep mythology that had uh, stakes and had roots in you know good and evil and heaven and hell and devils and angels and so there was this opportunity to do this really unique kind of a modern blend of what I would call kind of a movie soundtrack approach to TV that's that's theme-based, that's trying to help create scale and stakes, as well as underscoring the emotion. And she really, really understood that challenge and did, a, I think, a great job. And I guess, I mean, for me, some of my favorite moments, I think, are musically in episode one where Ava's running across the, the lake. I felt like uh, that theme, which was, you know, ultimately became like the Ava theme, um, really, really made me understand. I really saw that Tangent had this, you know, she she nailed it. And, and that really spoke for me to sort of the way I like to use music in the show. Um, and it's it's very emotional. It's it's not just a theme that sort of underscores how amazing that moment is, but it sort of was uplifting in a way that made you believe that Ava had come a long way, you know, in her in her um, abilities. And um, so, I mean, I use a lot of music in the show. I'm a big proponent of music. Sometimes I ask for more than I use because, uh, and then in the mix, we'll sort of make decisions about where music needs to be or doesn't need to be. Um, but I love it just as a fan of music. So I'm always keen to work with Tangeline and our music editor, Kevin, um, because it's just another way for me of helping the storytelling. I mean, again, Tangeline is like, is a storyteller as well. And that way her music is really helping the show in a way that I feel is uh, working, subliminally but also overtly to bring the audience into a into a sort of a another layer of understanding that isn't overt and I really appreciate that when it's done well 
And um, and I think, I mean, the other, I mean, there's so much good music, it's hard to pick. I, I think I remember that one scene in episode one because it, for me, sort of was early in the process and it really struck a chord for me, bad pun, but the idea that we were on the right track and so it really, it, it sort of, um, it locked into my memory as a, as a moment where I felt like we had a great exchange of communication and Tangeline was really involved. And then of course, there's all the, the needle drop, the original music that we put in the show, which is um, Lindsay Wolfington, who's our music supervisor. And she's the one who basically provides, you know, options for me for scenes like the dancing scene in one with, um, with Ava and Beatrice, and even just some of the, some of the fun tunes that pop in from time to time in other scenes that are um, that are original tracks, you know, from artists. And we used, you know, to that to great effect in season one, and we're doing it again in season two. So I'm, it's just tons of fun. I, I, I love, I love the music selection process and having two creative women who are super sharp and have access to and have great taste, you know, but also understand what the show is. They get the tone of the show. They get what we're trying to do. And it's, the, again, it's like a great partnership. You know, we, we, we have very few disagreements and I really like what they do. So it makes my life easy. <laughs> I, I can't, I'm, I've watched um, the season finale and the song Hymn for Her. And I I felt like, like a little tiny thing, like a, like a violin or a cello in my heart and like the breaking, the brittleness and, and how fleeting time can be like it was the sweat like it just was a swell within my heart and it, it enveloped me um and that's what you know adding music in, in these moments and yeah. you want when you're creating um these types of emotional tugging and connective yeah scenes. it's funny you know I, when when i when we got the song him for her into the edit um it was immediately powerful and um and I knew I kind of had a sense that it was going to be because sometimes you put music in it for the edit that you don't know if you could get the rights or you don't know if it's going to make it through till the end and you use it as but that's one of those tracks that I think went in really early into the edit and stayed all the way through. Um, uh, and it's funny sometimes you hear a song so many times it starts to lose its impact. And at one point <laughs> towards the end I think I'd heard it. I don't know. I mean, I must have watched the cut a hundred times and I was starting to go, oh, I wonder if this is a, the right song for this moment now. And I went to Tangeline actually, and I said, hey, would you like to compose something for this moment? And she was like, I can, but I really think this song is amazing and you should, you should keep it. And I thought, wow, if the composer is telling me to keep a track, then that's usually a really good sign that that's the right track, you know? instead of her having the chance to to write something so that was a that was a moment where I knew we had you know I knew it was always special but I just didn't understand after listening it too many times that it was gonna have the impact it did so I'm glad it does I got to watch screeners of the episodes early in advance before it actually was released and I, I must have watched that scene. I, I, I lost count, but, <laughs> but every moment there wasn't, there wasn't a part of my heart that didn't feel shattered oh. or like bittersweet that this is happening. But the, and then now the music really just, again, felt so enveloping, but so crushing. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm sorry to have done that too, but I'm also glad that, that, that it elicited a response because I guess that's the point. Well, among the emotionality, we get a lot of comedy uh, relief, at least a little bit this season as well. Um, and we get that sort of through characters like Camilla, characters like Yasmin, um, sometimes Mother Superior <laughs> as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, and as much as I love to watch, obviously, the drama and the suspense and the and the cinematography of things, um, these little clever comedy moments also feel like a, a needed breath that we get within certain dramatic or dynamic moments uh, such as the uh, the delivery truck <laughs> yeah the pastries yes <laughs> yeah those are actually from a real bakery we found in madrid <laughs> we didn't have to make them they were they, we just bought them so that was kind of fun 
a nice prop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> a work and a prop. Yeah. <laughs> so the 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 writing this season, it just felt um like these natural breaths that come about is why I keep using the word natural a lot because it's very an organic because it really does feel that way when you're watching the show. Um, that's what draws you in and, and keeps you in this world that you're watching. You're not a person watching a TV series. You are within this TV series. That's part of what draws that escapism in. Um, and I love that, again, as much as we get this suspense, these little sprinkled in moments of comedy help provide that breath that can sometimes throw you off in a good way, but also um, feel like they're a part of exactly what you need right then in that moment yeah yeah well we you know the tone of warrior nun is is really deliberate because it's warrior nun it's not it's not trying to be um we're not watching emily in paris we, yeah yeah i mean it's it we want the audience to enjoy the show on a level that it's entertaining without being you know heavy or preachy in a way that's um uh, takes itself too seriously, I guess you could say. And, and that's partially because we have a subject matter that's, that's you know, we, we're dealing with supernatural, we're dealing with this religious mythology. And, you know, I think it's important that the show exists in a realm that is um, honest of to the show's DNA and what it's, you know, what it's about. And that doesn't mean you can't have moments of of depth and seriousness within that. And you certainly can, and we can have action, we can have stakes, we can have death um, and love. And there's no reason, and I think with a tone like that, it gives you actually more opportunities to do more uh, with storytelling than if we had sort of planted our flag and said, no, this is a full on comedy or this is a full on drama, you know? And I think it's also, there's not a lot of shows right now that sort of walk that line between um, fun and excitement and adventure and um, romance because it's, you know, I think the, it's a lot of, there's a lot of dark shows out there. You know, there's a lot of shows that are pretty, uh, that use kind of a, a black space to mine for drama where things are horrible and things are terrible. And that kind of infects the whole show. And we always wanted to have fun. So the the point of the comedy really is to remind the audience every now and then that this is, you know, this is warrior none. This is not, you know, um, the new Pope, you know, which is also quite funny at times too. But, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to embrace what we think the audience wants, which is something that they can um, enjoy honestly like and and watch in a way that is that is um uh, 360 degrees of of um entertaining i certainly feel like there is a character every character really that i relate to i mean i have beatrice in me that i feel like you know i have all these wall i have a lot of walls and i feel like i've got camilla in me who wants to like prove something and has that has the ability you know has that ability to be sassy I have that you know sarcasm that I like to, to do sometimes and obviously you know be Beatrice like I said with her walls but you know like um we have um you know Yasmin who wants uh, who also is a character who's kind of learning and lessons and growing um <laughs> unexpectedly there's always a, there's a character in Lilith there's a little bit of darkness but you also want to root for her at the same time um, that there's a character that you can see a, a glimpse or or a sliver or you know whatever you want of an edge of of someone in yourself that um, makes it such a, a well-rounded series too that of course maybe even characters that you're not supposed to root for that you're you are finding yourself like mm, do I sympathize with this person a little bit am I supposed to sympathize with this person a little bit <laughs> I don't think I'm supposed to <laughs> you can you can do whatever you want Lisa we're not here to tell you what to do. <laughs> That's what I love, though, is that that it offers you a lot of different. Um, <laughs> it's like a choose your own adventure kind of sense to it in a, in a way. You know, would you go down an Ava path? Would you go down? Are you an age <laughs> worshiper? You know, like yeah. who, who's saving whom here? Whom is yeah. saving whom here? Yeah, it's the nice thing about having an ensemble 
you know, is we can, even though Ava is definitely the focal point of a lot of the plot and story, and, um, but the show is always intended to be an ensemble story, you know, and it really is about the sisterhood. So to deny kind of the group their, their due would, would run against the whole point of the show, which is kind of about this family, you know, and it's, yes, it's a dysfunctional family, but all families are dysfunctional. So there, so that's really, you know, an important part of what makes the show tick, you know, um, and, and we have such a great cast to, that portrays that family that where we have a wealth of opportunities, you know, to showcase these great stories and great talents. So it's not, it's a really great thing to have, you know, we don't have to choose, make these hard decisions about what to show, what not to show. It's like, everything is gold, you know? Absolutely. And, um, I, I just find myself, like I said, a little bit of, of something and every, and everyone. And, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to know what's going to happen next because there's so many, there's so many questions and then the answers haven't come yet. There's like little, little maybe answers that are kind of, that have like show up, but there's not a real fledged, fleshed out answer yet for a lot of the things. So uh, that's what also kind of keeps me on edge as well as like, are they going to go there yet? Where is it going to lead to? What are these crumbs kind of pushing? Well, I, ima I imagine season three will be, if we get season three, we'll do, it'll hopefully, we'll get season three. <laughs> it'll have the same impact that season two did against the questions of season one, you know, which our goal was always to move the show forward, move the characters forward answer some questions, but also pose new questions. And so the, the opportunity to uh, tell the next chapter will probably be built on a lot of what we, has come before. It, it, it gives me, again, these Buffy the Vampire Slayer vibes because, um, you know, Buffy, um, she died and went into this other realm and then they brought her back out of the other realm. She has a powerful sword. Uh, you know, she's a savior character too. So a lot of what I see in Ava is a lot of what I loved and what I watched Buffy as well and, and Sarah Michelle Geller's take on on that mm -hmm. character as well. And um, I love that I can see sort of parallels from a lot of different of the aspects as well. Um, and I just... I I'm in awe of the way that Alba portrays Ava as well as uh, just as much because um of of her pillar of <laughs> to use uh, to be a, she is quite a pillar within the se series and and as a person yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, no, she's amazing and she's the anchor um for a lot of you know how the show's direction is chosen in terms of story and uh, in terms of um, audience, I guess. Um, entry point because when you're an outsider like she is and you're part of something that's bigger than you are and that you're part of a bigger mythology that's something that everyone can relate to uh, as opposed to being an insider where you know everything or you have all this inside knowledge so we always loved Ava as a character for a, a show like this because you know the warrior nun in the OCS organization it's it's a big thing that could really get bogged down, you know, in just ex explaining too many things. But through Ava, we could we could basically allow the audience to walk in her footsteps, and not just on ter in terms of the information part of the show, but also the emotional uh, entry point of her having a second chance at life again, and what she is going to do with that second chance. So Alba really um, wonderfully uh, encom encompasses that sweetness, that innocence, but also that determination and that desire uh, to have, you know, everything, you know, that we all, we can all, we can all relate to. It's like, you want, um, you want to check off everything on your, on your to-do list, like we say in the show. And, you know, I think 
having an actor like Alba, who's very approachable, who is uh, welcomes you in, as opposed to keeps you at a distance, is essential for a show like ours because you know she, we're all taking the journey. You know, the audience is taking the journey with her, and we're taking the journey too as the filmmakers because we really rely on her a lot to um, guide our emotional, you know, how we feel, what's important, what's the, what the stakes are and what the um, message of the show is. So she has a lot on her shoulders as a character and as an actor <laughs> and there's a lot of action too. So she just, she has to do it all. You know, it's, it's quite something. She is like a phenomenal force, a compass. Um, yeah. And and so she, you know, is is steady and and leads the show in in as many directions as the audience needs to go. And I, I'm like so grateful for um, the incredible portrayal in that regard. And of course, the again the inclusivity that we get between the relationship that we get to watch between Ava and Beatrice develop, um, and that kind of also slow burn as the people say yeah and how healthy it, and the communication too so i wanted to also commend you all because of that aspect that we get to watch within that relationship develop is that it's a sort of healthy communication and the slow burn that makes it worthwhile makes it rewarding um for us as the audience to watch and, and again root for also in that regard yeah we're trying to make it normal i mean i think that you know it's uh the, the challenge is to make the characters believable and honest and truthful in the way they're be interacting, behaving with each other, regardless of, of whether the story is about a straight couple or a queer couple or a bi couple or gay, it doesn't matter. It's like our job as writers is to be um, honest with the characters. And so through honesty and through trying to mine um, honest emotional stakes, I think it's easier to make everything feel more, you know, or like you said, organic and natural, which is what I think we all wanna see regardless of, of um, our characters' relationships. You know, it just, we just wanna make them believable and relatable. And that's, you know, I think that's a good, a good um, indicator of whether we've done our job right. You know, if that feels like you said, earned and accepted at the right time in the right place in the story that things have happened in a way that they would happen, you know, within the confines of a TV show, obviously, but at least in a way that makes you feel something. And that's at the end of the day, what we're always trying to do is make the audience feel, you know, and care. Well, definitely the season finale left us uh, very breathless. Um, we got the we got the finale where we um, get this emotional uh, goodbye between Ava and Beatrice, and, and we don't know what this exchange kind of signifies because Ava is now in a whole new realm. And Beatrice, as we know, at the end end where we get the post credits, actually leaves the OCS. So it's kind of a full circle new beginning because uh, we don't know what's happening. Ava's in this whole other realm. Beatrice is off to wherever she may roam. <laughs> yeah. And um, it kind of starts with a feeling like a blank slate for a lot of, in a lot of sense as well um so where that might pick up whether Ava has aged <laughs> because of her time within the realm um where where Beatrice might find herself um uh, is something that uh a lot of fans are are excited and intrigued to pick up with when, when we get I keep saying when we get season three because um, so much that's left lingering is just like there. It's so palpable <laughs> that we want to yeah. be able to watch more right away. <laughs> here we are not able to, but we're fighting for it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, yeah, I mean, all these, all these questions will be answered one way or another. <laughs> <laughs> 
and I I feel again that, that so much is riddled um, within the show that I mean um, the, the saying is the pen is mightier than the sword but we might need to change that to semantics <laughs> <laughs> mightier than the sword that's funny <laughs> um yeah exactly it just um it feels like on a very cerebral level uh a lot of what the show clicks in your mind that it's clicking 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 as much as you're watching uh these incredibly empowering portrayals and on edge suspenseful moments that that there's the little box that are still clicking, clicking, clicking in the background. <laughs> <laughs> You're opening up new tabs in your brain. A lot of tabs open. Definitely a lot of tabs open. For us too, as writers, we're trying to keep too many tabs open sometimes, for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, we want to we want to make everything as complex and layered as we can without it being overwhelming and and, and confusing. So, you know, if we've found the sweet spot in terms of that balance, then I think. I speak for the other writers when I say that's a good thing, uh, that we can find that place where it's just enough of everything that it's not overwhelming and it's not boring. You know, we're right in the middle. Well, we have sort of heard, I guess, through um, Twitter that there are some scenes that might have been deleted, uh, at least Ava choice scenes of bedroom some scenes is this about something that more makes sense that um we're waiting we want to keep the audience engaged like you're talking about but we also want to make this earned again or is this something like this just didn't make sense within the constructs of the scene and we want to play out more of the relationship yeah sometimes it's <laughs> yeah it's, it's funny you know so the scene you're talking about was there was a scene i'd written in episode one where um Ava and Beatrice are sort of waking up together. Um, and it was, a, it was a scene that sort of, well, two things happened. One, we, the day we had to do the, um, the argument scene, the fight, mm -hmm. we realized that that scene was so important uh, and needed as much TLC and care that we could give it, that we probably wouldn't have time to do both. And that it was better to prioritize the scene that was really about that point in their relationship where they have this, you know, this, this um, confrontation. Um, because the scene, although the bed scene was, it was really sweet and everything, but it didn't move the story at all. It was really more of a character scene about how they were different. Like the way Ava is, in the morning versus the way Beatrice is in the morning, like two different, they're very different people, right? And it was more of a fun scene about how, uh, you know, you can be attracted to someone who's the opposite of you. And sometimes the opposite of you is really annoying, but it's also endearing. And that was a scene that I don't think, at the end of the day, I had to make the, I was actually directing the, I had to direct the argument scene because uh, we had a delay with Alba in uh, in the block of episode, we were supposed to shoot episode one and two. We weren't able to shoot that scene, so it got pushed later in the season. So I ended up directing that scene, and it was up to me to cut the other one, which is nice when that decision falls on the showrunner and the writer. And so I had to make kind of a decision that was helpful for me as a director because I would have more time to work on the scene that I thought was more important. But it was also a way of pushing me to realize that the scene in the bed was nice in a way as a, a little bit of spice, but it wasn't important in the way that the story was important. And I much was much more important for me to have more time to shoot the scene where they have this disagreement and make up. And I wanted that to work out. So it's funny, sometimes you make these decisions because the circumstances force you to make them, but you end up realizing that had we shot the scene, I probably might've might cut it out anyway in the edit because it was extra, it was a superfluous scene. And, and this season, I think we did really well not having a lot of filler in the show. Like there's not a lot of scenes that you can get rid of because you would lose story. But that scene had no story. It was purely just about a little bit about their relationship. It didn't really move the story forward. So that's, I guess that answers your question, but 
there aren't many scenes that we cut. I mean, at the end of the day, we we really didn't um, we didn't really have to make those tough decisions. We we taught, we we I think honed the scripts to a degree that was really um, razor sharp. Mainly because we can't. It's very hard to shoot things on our budget that you don't use because you're wasting time and money. And so we really had to make tough decisions early about what would stay and what would go. And that means that when you're filming, you don't have to make the tough decision of shooting something you don't need or cutting it out after you've shot it. So we have very few deleted scenes, almost none. And I don't, actually, I don't think we have a single deleted scene. We only have like little, little cuts from scenes where we shortened a scene, but we didn't shoot anything that didn't get um, used, I don't believe, in the season. But I like the subtext of a lot of the scenes as well. Like we get the scene where um, Ava touches the bed, like the side of the bed. Right. Uh, it looks like that from our, in uh, you know, from our intuitions or whatever, we can kind of feel like that's Beatrice's side of the bed that she's touching and like in that tenderness, the letter that she's trying to write Beatrice. Those are the things that I find also um, important. Yeah, <laughs> well, those little details are great. And we love using those little details. They're part of a bigger scene. That, that's obviously that scene that you're talking to about. Those are two scenes. The scene is another part of that. But that moment within the scene is something we can always keep and do. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that moment of her touching the bed was something I'd asked her to do um, for, I mean, it, I wasn't trying to make it too literal, but I wanted it to be about a lot of different things, which was about walking, think, knowing that she was going to be leaving things behind, you know, and, ma and making a decision that would impact the other side of the bed. But also it was her, um, you know, uh, having a tactile moment thinking I might be dead in a week or a couple of days and and just the ability to appreciate being alive makes you more in touch with just everything around you and it was also a moment where she was contemplating the the light coming through the window which was this force which was Adriel's new plague and how that represented her um sacrifice and what she needed to do because that light was essentially going to hurt people and she didn't want them hurt. So it had many layers of meaning, I think. Um, and the whole point, I mean, I don't want to ruin it for anybody, but it was never intended as one thing. It was always intended as layered ideas. Does that mean that uh, that Ava never really wrote the letter? <laughs> or, or no, the no, she did. She did write the letter. Yeah, she wrote the letter. We just didn't see her write the letter. And we, and what the letter said is essentially what she said to Beatrice in so many words over the rest of the episode. Um, which is is you know, the letter was just in case she never got a chance to tell Beatrice how she felt because that might have happened. Um, but I don't think there's anything missing. I think if the audience watches every scene after that point of the letter, everything that Ava says to Beatrice is what she would have put in the letter. I I think it's I like I said I think the the smaller moments, the moments that maybe aren't necessarily spoken um, or exchanges that are thought of. The tenderness that it, it provides it the poignancy that it offers the audience i think that's got a lot more weight to it than sometimes necessarily if we actually do see like a kiss or we do see a touch that those are the moments that sort of offer within the lines things that yeah. we get to enjoy and, and i agree and, and also you want them when they mean have meaning yeah as opposed to just as just there you know to not have to not mean anything i think i think it's restraint is important when you're telling a story like this and it focuses you on making sure that the value of the moments you have aren't um uh they're not like uh just for an excuse to to do them because you know it'll it'll get likes you know you want to make sure that you're doing it because it's um has a deeper impact and it has a contextual 
meaning to everything else that you've done. So it's important that you don't, I guess, um, ruin it because <laughs> you can <laughs> easily ruin those moments by exploiting them, you know? I think just uh, for me and, and my sense as a fan that I, I love that part of the buildup. I love that part of the tension or the layers that it offers another sided view of uh, the way that they get their relate to see their within their relationship um, that it offers. So I don't necessarily always need them to do anything um, to know that there's the affection there. Right. I think that's exactly what we're trying to do too. It's to not make it so it loses its value when it does happen. Well, um, speaking of relationships, we got to see uh, an evolution of Beatrice and Camilla's relationship this year, this season. Um, and I like that it's sort of like a passing of the torch in a way between the two of them. Yeah. But also, again, the same um, the same way that we got to see a lot of the their dynamic in season one um we get this speech from camilla towards beatrice where she says like you know i there's no shame in loving the warrior nun but you know the warrior nun will never really be yours they're, they're not meant to live yeah um, was this something that was always meant between these two characters um because i know that it, it i mean it does feel very much their dynamic but it also kind of feels like Mary through Camilla through Beatrice in a, in a layered way. Yeah, well. I mean, in the original draft, I think that line had been Mary's and we wanted to preserve it when we realized that we couldn't have Mary in season two. And so the line, I think, made its way because uh, we liked the line and we didn't want to lose it. So it became Camilla's line. But I think in the original draft of the scripts, it was Mary's. Um, uh, yeah, but but Camilla had her own track even before we had to make those changes. And so we incorporated that into Camilla's journey uh, because it fit. It was not out of context. You know, it was it was definitely something that you could say had more value from a point of, of history, personal history for for Mary, but the the fact is that Camilla is at a place where she understands how things work now and she can re and she's been observing everyone even in season one she observes everything oh, and she, sees, she sees everything yeah. so I always felt like it was completely legitimate that Camilla would say something like that um uh and you know as writers we don't anticipate these situations where we're asked to change everything at the last second um, and so we try to make the best of it in terms of the story we're trying to say, to tell. Um, and I think, you know, we often move lines around. I've, I, there were lines in season one that um, Lilith had that went to Beatrice, that Beatrice had that went to Lilith, that, you know, we were constantly changing things around when we were writing the scripts to spice up the scenes in some cases, have someone say something that was provocative or, um, and so it's one of those things that happens, but it, it wasn't, certainly wasn't something that we felt was a big deal because it, uh, it I felt like it was part of the, the journey Camilla was taking already. Someone who also took a, a, a giant leap <laughs> in their journey this season was Lilith. Yeah. Um, and we've gotten to see a more complex side of her, a darker side of her. And I wanted to talk a little bit about this evolution um, and maybe where you see her boundaries because she's kind of crossed them through her relationship with Adriel, but she's also still lingering in a way. Um, yeah. Even as much as she fought, obviously, with Ava, but there still seems to be um, some OCS love <laughs> in a sense as well. yeah well i think i think lilith really from, has a very interesting arc in terms of her um her journey um the you know the number one thing for lilith coming out of season one was this idea of how she could feel um worthy of herself in her own in her own mind 
in the in the sense that this newcomer in Ava who didn't earn the the, the yeah. halo had had somehow you know been acknowledged as this as the warrior nun and that she had not and obviously that has less to do with the mythology of the show more to do with Lilith's point of view of herself right and so her journey in season two is really about accepting herself regardless of whether she was a warrior nun or not and and finding that love for herself and by making her kind of a monster we expanded that idea that she had to get over that the idea that she was a monster that she had to fall in love with the transformation she was going through and that by falling in love with her change she was truly loving herself for the first time and that adriel is really just opening the door for her to do that he's not making it happen he's that change is going to happen anyway he just knows that it'll be easier for him to manipulate her if she loves herself in a way that she can associate with him but the truth is Lilith would have, I think, invariably come to accept herself and loved her new, her new being one way or the other. Adriel just saw an opportunity and took it. And I think that whatever he fed her in terms of, you know, rationale for fighting on his side may have roots in something honest and true, which is, is Rhea good or bad? We, don't, we haven't laid that out yet. And this <laughs> larger war that's going on may get the OCS and a little swept up into it in ways that they have no idea because they're all being manipulated in a sense. So I think Lilith is very sharp and she understood two things in that moment. She understood that Adriel revealed himself not to be what, what he actually claims to be, which is an angel, when he kind of, his face got ripped apart and he sort of uh, <laughs> reassembled. She saw something that was not, you know, holy or necessarily um, what in her mind the st Adriel's story was. And B, I think that in, uh, in seeing um, Adriel destroyed by another force, it made her realize this was not about team Adriel or team Ray, it's about team Lilith. And Lilith needs to look out for herself and that makes her closer to her sisters, not further away. And so I think that um, everyone's got these complex, you know, emotions about themselves and, and their situation and Lilith is no different. Um, and so it's also about, I think, breaking the spell of what you think is the truth. And as nuns in season two, we often point out the fact that, you know, they're reevaluating the mythology they've been told and the truth they've been told. And so everything is in question, you know, even for, even Beatrice, she leaves, she's leaves the church because she realizes these have been lies, you know, I've been lied to. And so it's no different for Lilith. And I think that, you know, in that she can pretty much do whatever she wants <laughs> in a sense, because she's, she's living her own existence. You know, she's dealing with her own issues, but at least now she's come to accept herself and doesn't need the halo to love herself, you know, and that's a freedom. She's, she's kind of emancipated and that's nice. And I think, you know, um, it's a really interesting, I think it's one of my favorite journeys of the season is, is Lilith's. And it's certainly, and I think Lorena did an amazing job, you know, of just trying to keep all of that buttoned in, you know, holding that in and allowing it to unfold in a way that was very, um, very, you know, poignant. So, uh, yeah, I guess that um, I think I'm answering your question. I'm not sure. She's definitely got this um, different new fire to her and a new perspective um, on on herself for sure. Yeah. And, yeah. and the lines that she walks, and I love yeah. that she's, like, free. she's, she's free. free. She's free. She found yeah. that freedom within walking these dark dark edges that yeah. she needed to go through though in order to find yeah. out yeah i mean it's she's remember she's been in a in a um a mindset that's never changed for mo all of her life so it's, it's really hard to break out of that sometimes absolutely um and then when you talk about um all these questions like we don't know who oh anything about raya and and um we know that 
Um, well, I know, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> but we, it was intentionally vague because, you know, a godlike figure is someone we automatically assume has benevolence, but that doesn't necessarily always mean they're benevolent in our definition. It may in their definition. And as humans, we tend to ascribe people with power with uh, the, you know, the intentions of looking out for our interests, but that's not always true. Is that why when Beatrice asks Ava in the finale, who is that? And Ava says, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think Beatrice is wondering if that was God, oh. or, God or Goddess, you know, and, and I think Ava is still not sure how to define Rhea because we want to put Rhea in a box of our language and our point of view and our perspective, which is in religion. It's like, well, if, if someone's all powerful, does that mean they're God essentially? And it breaks the spell of, you know, whatever you've been told, you know, your whole life. So I, for us, that was just a moment where everything comes into question, you know, because a lot of the things in the show are mirror images of, of, you know, scripture and stories from the Bible and whatnot. And so we wanted to make sure that there was always this double edged meaning to everything that you could, that perspective was all, it was all about perspective and all about whatever keyhole you're looking through, you know, you're only going to see what you see and you're not going to see the larger space. And so very much a lot of what warrior nun is doing with its mythology is, is the perspective of the characters themselves trying to figure out what's going on without an ex, without a, a guide, you know, without um, something to explain it. And I think that's uh, how a lot of people are going through life, <laughs> you know, making it up as we go. Yeah. I mean, um, we see kind of see Rhea in, in two different kind of lights. I mean, she doesn't help Ava at all. <laughs> and also we see her lying on the floor crying um under adriel's kind of influence or power so we don't know a lot about again is she an all-powerful being why didn't she intervene can she intervene what's meant to be well uh, certainly bringing her through the portal was by adriel's design something that was going to be bad for her yeah you don't bring someone you know involuntarily through <laughs> right. the portal you built unless it's going to hurt hurt them somehow. So clearly Adriel had an understanding that her power would be diminished the moment he brought her into our world. And that's exactly what happened. And then the crown would have been the, the, the finish, the, the nail in the coffin. So, you know, I, that's, that's where we were coming from. Well, just to kind of cap off things, I, I want to say congratulations again on the outpouring um, between the fans and the critics. Um, it's gotten, you know, Rotten Tomato, 100% uh, by critics, 99% by the audience. Uh, there is a Forbes magazine article uh, that says it's Netflix highest audience scores ever. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> And you've gotten Snooky to, to tweet about you, yeah. your show. Uh, there's a we need, twi we need Taylor Swift. We need Taylor Swift to tweet about it. Um, <laughs> and and uh, Kim Kardashian and all the other people who have like a zillion followers. That's, <laughs> that's the next step. I was just going to say, I mean, besides obviously getting critics to watch, which people are, you know, doing, the fans are, are behind all that and, and, socially through TikToks and their friends and relatives at the Thanksgiving table. Um, <laughs> what, you know, what does this outpouring, of course, you know, mean for you personally, professionally? Mm -hmm. And of course, what can, you know, you offer fans as far as maybe, you know, the way that we can continue to support yeah. the show? Well, uh, personally, it's incredibly gratifying and rewarding to think that we, as the team, reached out to the audience that loves the show and gave them something they wanted, which is really great. That is the most important thing for me. I always feel like I work for the fans, not for you know the network. And um, so to know that we delivered uh, something that was uh, had meaning and that was well executed and that was stood up to their um, 
you know, standards, high standards is very gratifying because we work really hard. You know, it's, it's, it's a, a year of our life making the show and a season of the show it takes a year and it's a hundred percent, you know, constant work. And so you want it to be, you want it to be appreciated and enjoyed and that's really rewarding. So it's very gratifying. So on that front, thank you to the fans uh, for exchanging that love um, and returning it back. And then number two, I think for the um, show, yeah, there's a lot of metrics that I think Netflix takes into consideration that isn't always necessarily just the numbers versus the cost of the show. I think that there are things like social media impact and um, critical consensus and you know awards and things like that. I think they go that go into their decisions of renewing certain shows versus others. I don't know. They don't tell me what those things are and they don't share the data with me. I can only glean what I can glean like from you um, telling me or what I read online. So they're all, the, the uh, conversation, as long as it keeps going is always a good thing. There's, it's not bad. I think to help get season three, it's, I mean, I don't know if there's anything that can be done on such a large scale in the, in the amount of time Netflix takes to make their decisions, but you never know. I would say the only thing I can think of is that there's a lot of people out there who've never heard of the show. And tw social media tends to be an echo chamber. So anyone who's on Twitter talking about Warrior Nun is probably saying it to someone who already knows about Warrior Nun. It's the outside world that doesn't know about Warrior Nun that, would that needs to be um, brought into the fold. And so that's a trickier ask because how do you get that word out? And that's why I thought you know getting more media attention on the show is important because that's has an incredible reach beyond the social media um, bubble. Uh, and so people who are not normally on Twitter, and people who aren't already fans of the show who want to hear about how good it is, will be curious, hopefully, and check it out. And that's why the, the Rotten Tomatoes thing is kind of super cool because whether you're a fan of Warrior Nun or not, or you've even heard of it, if you see it on the on that list, you'll you might just take the chance. And if you do, there's a really good chance you'll like it, you know. And so, I'm hopeful that that's the kind of media that spreads the word, that spreads the gospel of Warrior Nun, and that we find a bigger audience organically out of just the fact that people tell their friends, "This is really great." and really entertaining. I mean, Squid Game is a great example of a show that just spread through word of mouth because people were like, oh my God, you have to see this show. It's so it's so crazy. Uh, and, you know, I, that's hard to do these days because we're so inundated with new things and, 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 and trending things. Warrior Nun's in season two, so it's not new. It's, you know, it's old by modern standards. <laughs> So finding a way to bring it new um, energy is really challenging. And I, I feel like it's um, hopefully it's the, uh, the story of its love, the fan love and the success and, the, and the, the, that will generate other stories about it through the media that will attract an audience. Because it's not like it used to be like, um, I remember Breaking Bad was on Netflix for three or four years or three years before it got kind of this, the head of steam it needed to become this hit show um, on AMC. And, you know, a show needs a time to find its audience sometimes. And, you know, I think Warrior Nun is one of those shows. It needs, it needs, it needs uh, time for people to, to talk about it, you know, and discover it. I definitely know that there's power power behind your voice, <laughs> behind everyone's voice, and everybody's voice matters. So yeah, I mean, I think that it's... you know whether you're sharing it socially. Uh, not to interrupt you, I'm sorry, but no, no, it's fine. The power to share it socially um, is ex you know extremely important, but also like you're saying, the ability to turn someone new who might not know or um, is a Netflix subscriber or that's constantly inundated like there's a new netflix show every day yeah. it's coming out you know it's really tra it's really tricky and this this saturated. month is particularly hard because we've had like manifest the crown 1899 and it's it's a very busy 
uh, Netflix month compared to when season one came out, which was, you know, uh, we were kind of this uh, one of the only new shows. Uh, it's 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 much harder to to kind of carve out our space. But, you know, I mean, I think the momentum is already uh, creating waves. The fans have already done a, a great job because now there's this external awareness. It's converting that external awareness, hopefully, into new viewers. Well, in the time of TV series, um, queer TV series being canceled and, and the epidemic of LGBTQ series um, being canceled in, in that sense, um, to have a show like Warrior Nun and continue to tell people, you know, like in season one, you know, it says like what what makes you different is, is makes you beautiful or like there's no shame in loving someone else of the same sex. These these um, affirming me messages within the series, they matter. And I, I appreciate having that aspect now more than ever because the political landscapes everywhere have gotten so tumultuous that yeah. we need these reminders. We need these shows that reflect these messages reflect our rep representation and the inclusivity that it offers i agree I'm right behind you <laughs> <laughs> saluting you <laughs> thank you very much for thank for the you. work that you do within this within this series and and again all the people behind it that just um add that love that layer um and that appreciation for that well i'll pass it on to the writers directors cast and crew for sure.